So welcome to another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Dr. Tanya Ducey at uh, the University of Idaho. Uh, welcome, Tanya. Um, to get us started, can Thanks, you... Thanks, Michael. I'm glad to be here. To get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I am what I call a K-20 educator. My background is a secondary licensure in ag education from Texas A&M University, and I have a deep love of secondary education in general. But then I found myself beginning to work more with colleges and universities, and then even taking it a step further and went into continuing adult education. So that's where I get that 20 piece, where it's not just K through 12, and then 13 through 16, it's also the adult and continuing ed. Uh, I then went on to get my uh, PhD in learning design and technology from the University of Georgia. And so I've continued to keep one foot in the continuing education world and one foot in the traditional education system world of secondary, primary, secondary, and higher education. All right. Now, I know you have some background with K-12 online learning, but you also have a, a rich background with just looking at creative ways of doing technology integration and makerspace stuff within the K-12 environment with teachers that you work with. Um, in this situation where we're, you know, we've got folks now that have to come up with ideas for remote learning and remote instruction, in many cases in very short time periods, is there any advice you'd give to those people? So much advice. In fact, um, probably folks are feeling like there's a deluge, an avalanche of advice. Uh, in this case, though, I do have a couple of points that I've been trying to share consistently. Um, I am the accidental K-12 online supporter, and that's because of my heavy support of continuing ed that was online, because when I was a continuing education instructional designer and then later e-learning manager, I started to take those practices and think about how we could modify them for K-12. Vice versa, there's practices that I've picked up from the K-12 online and virtual teachers and administrators I work with that I then pass forward to the upper levels of online learning. But in this case, my number one tip for all of our teachers pivoting for remote instruction and dealing with this new brave new world of pandemic pedagogy, keep it simple. Seriously, just keep it simple. It is a broad landscape of tools. And this was a fantastic conversation that was a little bit like, but, Yesterday, a friend of mine who's been active in homeschooling, his four kids, was talking about, do I have this on Facebook Live, or is this in Slack, or is this in Discord, or is this something, another, am I going to be in Google Classroom, am I going to be in Canvas? It, oh my gosh, our heads are just spinning with the tools that are out there. So keep it simple. And remember, as educators, that we're working with overtaxed families who are trying to learn a lot of these technologies rapidly. So if you have the ability to use tools, pick a single tool or two tools and try to be consistent within your district with how it's used. If you're working with communities who do have homeschool populations and take advantage of multiple educational services, be mindful of that. That again, we don't wanna get trapped in, am I using Zoom or Hangouts or Meet or WebEx? Which tool do I need to have and have downloaded and updated and have the right drivers for? So just keep it simple. And know that not everything has to be a synchronous video meeting, that this is where we can design simple low-tech activities. Uh, Michael and I have a mutual uh, faculty member from our graduate program who likes to create PowerPoint games. I think about how to do that with so many different tools now, how to create something that's just a non-linear scavenger hunt or how to take what we might do digitally and flip it into the home. I love paying attention to my friends and what they're doing right now. Sight reading and taking little strips of paper and writing words on them and hiding them around the house or turning activities into games depending on the grade level. My favorite for any age because it's scalable, integrate the science of everyday life. If you're helping do the dishes, let's talk about how soap is a solvent 
and how solvents help us with cleaning. And maybe we can even make it relevant about current events and talk about the coronavirus and how coronavirus is held together by what we would call little grease bonds and why soap is such an effective solvent for those bonds. Let's go plant flowers because it's March and it's almost April and in most of the country we can start to get outside a little bit. I did have snow in Idaho yesterday, but we've been planting in our garden flowers and vegetables. And let's talk about growth and life and cycles and biology. Let's have kids take a little piece of paper, non-digital, and a ruler and measure how tall that plant grows every day. And then we can create a graph. Now, if that's a third grader, that might look just as it was. If it's more high schooler, then we can do other activities. Or you can challenge your high school to go build something, build a greenhouse, build a hoop house. But let's use the science of everyday life if digital learning isn't going to be possible. So that's my main advice for parents and teachers. Uh, with that, and this kind of rolls it together, setting a schedule is huge. And I don't just mean it because of a timing situation. We have millions of Americans working from home and millions of children competing for bandwidth with their parents. Uh, I was in a meeting last week with colleagues where the husband and wife were concerned how they were going to manage their bandwidth. And I say this as someone who lives in rural Idaho and literally only has satellite internet for a main broadband option. Charter is in my area, but does not serve my street and by street, I use that term very loosely. Uh, there's three houses and I'm surrounded by farmland. Uh, Frontier communication does not serve my road. I can now use T-Mobile as a hotspot and that's actually better than satellite internet. So I'm very cognizant of bandwidth issues. Schedules help us with that. So knowing when I need to be online and setting boundaries to say, I'm not available at this time because I know that my partner or my children need bandwidth at that time. We all have to be a little bit more flexible in thinking about that. And when I say I'm not available, it no longer just means that I'm physically not available. It means that my resources are not available as well. But uh, schedules also help with sanity. Sticking to that regular activity and being reminded that learning is a lifelong endeavor and that we are always reading. Now, it doesn't have to be reading from a book. I'm reading about current events. I'm looking at a web, all sides to find out different media bias because boy, is it ever a time to talk about media bias and critical literacy in what we read. So thinking about how and what we learn differently and integrating that into our schedules can help us and help keep us sane. But that means being flexible above all and knowing when it's time to step away from the news or knowing when it's time to step away from work or knowing when it's time to step away from learning activities. That's huge. Well, and that was a whole lot to say at once. And you hit actually the second question I was going to ask anyway, but I, I think you've hit one of the themes that I've started to see in some of the media now that, um, I haven't had any of my previous folks talk about it when you're looking at, you know, stepping away from the news. One of the things I've seen a lot about in the past two days is the issue of screen time and, yes. you know, limiting screen time. And I think that also plays into this idea of, of scheduling and, and knowing that there are things we can do outside of the, the computer that folks can still be learning environments. So I, I thank you for that advice, Tanya. And, uh, um, so this has been another episode of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning, today with Dr. Tanya Dusay. Thanks, Michael.